What's up everyone, it's Cody, back again with another video. And recently I decided I wanted to update my personal website. And so with that, I wanted to finally learn this Kotlin framework called Ktor. It essentially allows you to build web applications, web services, and APIs. And for this project in particular, I wanted to build some APIs with this because I wanted to have a dynamic website that could load and show my recent YouTube videos and have people sign up for a newsletter that I'm starting. In this video, I'm going to walk you through how I learned Ktor in just under seven days. If you stick around until the end of this video, you will know exactly what I did and you can follow those same steps so that you yourself can learn Ktor in seven days as well. So with the first day, I really wanted to understand how Ktor worked and so I found a tutorial on Ktor's official developer documentation that walked me through how to build APIs using Ktor. I started off by creating a new project with IntelliJ. My intent with this was I was going to start off with the tutorial, but I would be migrating from that code in the tutorial over to my own API. And so I set it up as if I was just going to start a brand new project that was going to be built from the ground up and not following a tutorial. After setting up the project, the next thing to do was to actually start following the tutorial. The first thing that I noticed was they had a GitHub link with the final project. And so I opened that up in a new link and that would allow me to reference that just in case I were to get stuck. After that, I found myself setting up the dependencies. So this was bringing in the Ktor server dependencies, the Ktor core dependencies. I also was able to configure the application.conf file, which actually, didn't really know too much what went into that. And so this is where having that tab open really came in handy. I was able to reference what their application.conf file looked like, and I pretty much just copy and pasted that and, and was good to go. The next part of this tutorial was setting up the application entry point. And a neat thing with Ktor is they pretty much just recommend doing extension functions for everything. And so I created an extension function on top of the Ktor application class, named it module, which was what they recommended naming it. Later on, I would actually change this to be named main, but not super important right now. So with the entry point out of the way, the next thing to do was to actually set up the different routes. And the first route that we were going to be creating was related to customers. And it would have me creating a git post and delete route for that customer. Now, before I could start adding functionality to those routes that I had created, I needed to tell Ktor how to handle JSON. The neat thing with Ktor is they recommend using the Kotlin X serialization library if you are going to be serving up JSON. And a nice thing with Ktor is within the application class, you can tell it how to handle different content. There's this content negotiation feature that you can install. And then you just have to say, use JSON and it'll just magically work. Now that we had the JSON serialization working, the next thing to do was really just create those different routes, fill in the blanks. So the Git request would return a list of customers. If I wanted to do a Git with a customer ID, it would return just the single customer. If I wanted to create a new customer, that was a post request. And then if I wanted to delete a customer, I would supply an ID and it would delete that customer. After that was out of the way, the next thing this tutorial had me do was actually set up a orders route. And so this would just be for managing orders between those customers. A lot of it was pretty much the same thing that I had done with the customer routes though. The last major part of this tutorial was talking about how to actually test your APIs. And this actually taught me that IntelliJ has this really cool feature where you just create a new file with an extension of .http, and then you could just have it test a bunch of your HTTP requests. I then closed out the evening by enabling chorus functionality with the Ktor application. It was very similar to adding JSON. It was just a very simple block of saying enable cores. After that, I went, I watched the latest Kenny Gunderman video. I smashed the like button for the YouTube algorithm and then I went to bed. To start out the second day, I found myself commenting out all of the code that I had just written in the previous day. I wanted to keep it around so I could reference it, but really this was the day that I was going to start writing my actual application. The first thing that I wanted to add to my website was a list of recent YouTube videos that I had uploaded. In order to do this, I would need to use the YouTube data API, which would require having a secret API key that could retrieve my videos. That is really where Ktor came in handy because I was able to place the secret API key in the Ktor service and no one needed to know about it. Since I was going to be proxying requests from my Ktor server to the YouTube data API, 
I actually had to add another dependency to this project and that dependency was the Ktor client libraries. Previously we had the Ktor server dependencies, but because this was also going to act as a HTTP client, we added the client ones as well. Setting up the HTTP client was pretty similar to setting up the server. The main difference was really you would install a JSON feature instead of a content negotiation. Before I could make a request to the YouTube data API, I had to model what the response was going to look like. And so we had a couple of small data classes set up. The nice thing with the Kotlin X serialization library is you can tell it to be lenient with how it deserializes the data. And you can also tell it to ignore unknown keys. So I only had to include really the data that I cared about coming back from the recent videos API. I didn't have to model all of it, which saved me a ton of time because the YouTube data API returns a ton of data. At this point, I could start proxying API requests to the YouTube data API and then transforming the data a little bit and then returning it back to my front end so that it could display the recent videos that I had uploaded. Now I could, and I really should add some error handling to this request, but I don't know, realistically it's YouTube. How often does it go down? If it goes down, it won't be ideal. My server will start responding with a 500 response, but eh, it's good enough for now. One thing that I had to keep in mind with this is the YouTube data API has rate limits in place. And so you get 10,000 credits per day where you can run requests. The search request that I was doing cost 100 credits now on a normal day. This would be completely fine. I probably will get like two or three people looking at the website, but we could get some peaks in traffic and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to get rate limited. And so I decided to add a light caching layer on top of this. Instead of going with an in-memory solution, I decided to use Google Cloud Data Store where it would store all of the results. And then instead of returning the YouTube videos directly, it would first get the YouTube videos if the cache had expired, store them in Google Cloud Data Store, and then it would return the recent videos from Google Cloud Data Store. If the cache hadn't expired, it would just not make that network request and return them directly from Google Cloud Data Store. I don't want to do a deep dive into how I learned Google Cloud Data Store in a short amount of time. If you want me to go into that, I would be more than happy to do another video but I was able to get that set up in really a couple of hours. It was super easy to use. And that was really it for the second day. On the third day, I wanted to ensure that what I was building could actually be deployed. And so I shifted my focus into being able to build the Ktor service and run it inside of a Docker container, because I know if I could run it in a container, I could run it anywhere. So I started off by Googling Ktor Docker and as luck would have it, the official Ktor documentation had a guide that did just that. So I went ahead and clicked the link and it was time to start following another tutorial. The first step of the tutorial was setting up your Gradle configuration to make sure that you had a main application class. Since I had already followed another tutorial with Ktor, I already had that set up. So I was able to skip that step. From there, I was able to create a new Docker file and they pretty much just gave the exact Docker file. So I went ahead and did command C, command V, and I only had to change a couple of things. With their Docker file, they were naming their application app with my application. It is called API. So I just replaced app with API. The next part was running the Gradle command to actually build my service. So it was like Gradle W and then install dist. It went through, built the application, and after that, it was time to run the docker build command, built the docker container, and now it was time to actually try to test it. I went ahead and ran the docker container on port 8080. I updated my front end code so that it would be directing traffic to that docker container. And because Bob is my uncle, the container just worked. Everything was working fine. I was seeing YouTube videos. It was awesome. I was legitimately surprised by how quick I was able to get this up and running. It only took me 30 minutes. And so it's like, well, I'm not done coding today. So I'm gonna try one more thing. That one more thing was getting this running in Google Cloud Run, which is a way to manage different containers. You basically just throw a container at it and it will figure out how to run it. Followed a couple of tutorials, about 45 minutes later, I was able to start seeing API requests returned from my Google Cloud Run instance. It was pretty awesome. So now that I was confident that I was going to actually be able to run this API somewhere, the next part was actually getting back into my Ktor service. This time it was going to be adding a new route, which was going to be under marketing, email, 
because I wanted to set up a newsletter. So for this endpoint, I needed to set up a way for visitors to provide their first name, their last name, and their email address because I wanted to be able to send them emails. Now, in order to build this, I would need to implement a post request. Previously with the YouTube API, I only needed to implement a Git request. So there was a little bit more work that had to actually go into the post request, so let's talk about that. The first thing that I had to keep in mind was this post request was going to take that first name, last name, and email address. It was going to transform it into something that MailChimp's API could understand. First part was getting my hands dirty with the serialization library again, creating not only the request that I expected from the front end, but also creating the request that MailChimp needed and then writing the code that would actually transform my request into the MailChimp request. After that request was set up, the next part was actually focusing on the response that I was getting back from the MailChimp API. They actually do error handling, so I, I couldn't avoid it this time. Some of the errors that I had to account for were if the email address was not valid. So unfortunately I couldn't test things with at example.com because it would say, hey, it's not a real email address. The next one was if someone had already signed up to the newsletter or they were in the pending status, it would return an error that you shouldn't do a post request, you should actually do a put request. In this case, I didn't really wanna do a ton of front end error validation and so I just kind of molded those errors into something that would be useful later on. Now that everything was set up with the API, it was time to actually hook it up to my website and test it out. The first thing that I noticed was it didn't work. So even though I had enabled cores on the first day and everything seemed to be working okay, it turned out that the post request was not enabled by cores by default. After a lot of Googling, I figured out that my cores implementation had to also allow for non-simple content types because I guess the post request I was making was a non-simple content type. So we enabled that and then everything started working. At this point, I had everything hooked up Docker was still running, and so really all that I had to do now was deploy everything, including my static website. So I first pushed up my latest KTOR service updates, which included that email marketing API that I had added. Google Cloud accepted it, it was running, so that was pretty good to see. I then went through a variety of Google Cloud tutorials to figure out how the heck am I going to host my static website I was able to find a couple tutorials on how to host a static website with Google Cloud Storage, so I went ahead, followed those. After a couple of hours of going through all of those tutorials, I was finally able to pick up my iPhone, type in ingle.dev into Safari, and it was returning traffic. Pretty effing awesome. I am not a KTOR expert, but after just under seven days, I was able to deploy an entire service running off of KTOR and I was able to run through a bunch of different errors and a bunch of different issues. And so I feel confident that if I need to do that again, I would be able to. When it comes to learning something new, you always want to start off with a personal project in mind because that is really how you will be able to solidify what you are learning. In this case, I wanted to update my personal website because it was holding me back from doing some really cool stuff in the future. Even though I was following a tutorial, there were plenty of opportunities where that tutorial just wasn't enough, especially after I was starting to actually work on the personal project itself. And so I found myself Googling stuff pretty often. I also didn't focus on getting things perfect because honestly, I'm not an expert. I don't know how to build a perfect KTOR service. And so for things like errors, and even with my bootstrap and view implementations, those are far from perfect. The plus side is those exist now, and I can start iterating on those. And the next thing that I wanna do is really learn much more about Vue.js and learn much more about bootstrap because it's been about six years since I last used Bootstrap. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and click the notification bell because there are gonna be some more tutorials just like this one coming out in the near future. That's it, that's the video. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one.